Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, Ask an Expert is a webinar series created by uh, Connector NL and Team Grow NL uh, with the St. John's Board of Trade. Um, my name is Tanya Heath. Uh, I'm with Team Grow NL. Uh, this is an initiative that aims to help local businesses meet their human resources needs by providing key information regarding immigration and the attraction of expatriate Newfoundlander and Labradorians living abroad. Uh, we also have Shanna Mugford and Ashley Burge here. Uh, they are from Connector NL with the St. John's Board of Trade. Connector NL is a program that helps individuals that are new to the provincial workforce grow their professional network and uh, connect with career opportunities. So a little bit about this series. Um, it's going to allow industry experts and employers to engage with job seekers that are interested in working in various sectors of Newfoundland and Labrador. Today, we will be focusing on the technology industry um, that you, you already know that, that's why you're here. Um, and with us, we have Paul Preston and Josh Green. So um, a little bit about them. Um, Paul is the CEO of the Newfoundland and Labrador Association of Technology and Innovation. Uh, where he and his team work to develop and grow the province's technology and innovation sector through talent and growth programs, adv advocacy, and being a voice for the sector. Um, Josh is the CEO of uh, MISA. He uh, founded as Empowered Homes in 2014, right after completing his mechanical engineering degree at Dalhousie University. Um, so him and his co-founder slash brother, Zach, uh, they've led the team at uh, MISA to bring, the market, bring to the market the MISA smart thermostat for baseboard heating, which has now shipped close to 100,000 devices across Canada and the US. Uh, so how this session is gonna work, uh, Paul and Josh will speak for about 10 minutes each. Um, they have a few slides um, that's gonna be um, shown on your screen. And then I'm gonna pass it off to Shanna. Uh, she's gonna take you through a question and answer period. Um, so feel free during the, um, during the presentations, you can type your uh, questions into the chat or the Q&A box um, down at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will address them after, uh, so in the question and answer period. So um, that's it for me right now. So let's get started and I'm gonna pass things all off to Paul. Thanks, Tanya. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. It should be seamless for everyone on the call, I hope. All right, I got a thumbs up. Thanks everyone for joining us. I have a few slides I'm gonna walk through. Not a lot, it's not gonna be death by PowerPoint. Uh, I'll, I'll be as snappy as I can be and uh, leave some time for Q&A at the end for sure. Uh, I, I'm starting Zoom calls these days by telling people that if a dog barks in the background or a kid comes in the room, uh, that's just like these days with everyone working virtually and, and at home. Actually, just yesterday, I had my board chair call me for a, uh, for, a, for a meeting and my daughter, because she had an iPad, which is linked by my iCloud ID, um, she answered on the iPad when my board chair called my phone and said, no, dad can't come to the call right now, he's in the shower. So uh, <laughs> lots of interesting stories, I think, through this whole scenario. Um, so I hope you're all doing well and stay safe. Uh, so to give you a perspective of who we are and the technology sector in the province, uh, first I'll talk about just the ecosystem here. So the tech sector here is $1.6 billion. That's been proven by a couple of different independent uh, organizations. That's just the pure technology sector. So when you think about tech firms whose very existence is about adopting tech, it's those companies. To put 1.6 billion in perspective, that's bigger than tourism here, it's bigger than traditional fishery, bigger than farming, bigger than, than forestry. So in and of itself, it's, it's a robust, dynamic, vibrant sector and growing. Um, the other thing I'd say though, is every industry is becoming tech enabled. So when we talk about jobs that we have in the tech sector and we need more people, we need more immigration, that's only gonna get really that, that issue is gonna be exacerbated because every other sector of our economy are also trying to become highly tech enabled and go digital. So we're seeing hires in every sector, including our primary sectors, fishery, mining, oil and gas, et cetera. Uh, numbers employed, are, uh, we have recent data, about 4,000 people are employed directly in the sector. The province did some uh, recent uh, studies that show the numbers more like 6,500 people. Uh, either way, it's, um, there's a lot of people employed in the sector and it's a key part of our DNA and the vibrancy of our economy here. About 165 local companies are pure tech. I actually think we're getting around 200 now, uh, pure tech companies. And if you include firms that are really highly tech enabled, uh, that might not be considered a you know, pure technology company. The number is more like 600 companies here. So big employer, robust, and vital for our economy. 
So who Natty is, we are an industry association. So advocacy is part of what we do, which is talking to governments, the federal and provincial and other leaders to ensure that we remove barriers for our companies to make sure that we're you know, really advocating for the things that can help tech companies start, grow and scale from here so that they don't have to, to move away or they're not just always purchased and bought up and the IP moved elsewhere. We want to remove those barriers. So it leads to three priorities for us and by and far the number one is talent. So for our sector, it's on our website, it's in everything I do, talent is our number one priority. And I can talk you blue in the face about all the things that we're doing to improve talent, starting from the K to 12 system to the more medium term things, which are getting the college and university to produce more grads, and then more shorter term initiatives, which internship programs, wage subsidy programs, and private colleges getting programming out. So I can, I can talk all about the things we're doing, but the number one thing I want you to leave with is that it's our number one priority as the industry association because our companies can't find enough people for the jobs they have. The, there's a real talent gap and a, a real surplus of jobs. Where the demand and supply of talent right now is really out of whack. We need to make sure we have a lot more people available for the jobs we're creating. Other priorities for us, obviously business scaling, helping companies to grow and digital transformation for us is how we elevate the importance of technology and innovation for all sectors of the economy. So that's us realizing every sector here, if they want to be globally competitive, they've got to think about adopting technology, becoming digitalized, etc. So I'll, just a couple of a uh, couple of more slides. This is uh, Genoa Design. I was there in August, and Genoa on my board. Uh, they're a shipbuilding company located uh, here, started here, have offices elsewhere as well, but uh, main office in Mount Pearl. Um, and this was a new building they had retrofitted and, and built out. This room was empty in August. And this was in anticipation of the hires they were gonna have this year. That was August. This picture I'm showing next is as of January when I had another board meeting at Genoa. That I couldn't get the whole room because there's some confidential things. The room is full and they've actually outgrown that space already. The building was only completed within the past year and they've already outgrown the space. So the number of hires that we see companies here locally, it's, it's growing, it's, uh, it's amazing. To give you a sense about the makeup of the sector, average number of employees per company is 40 and that's because we have a lot of high growth potential firms that are still earlier stage so you might have some companies have 5 10 and 15 we have the bigger ones like vision 33 and verifin that have 500 people and then we have companies in between i think uh, joshua's company is probably 65 or 60 ish or or maybe even a bit, hot, bit more um, the one thing I'd say that I don't like about this slide is that it's still 77% uh, male dominated. So we have a lot of initiatives focused on more women in tech. We need more diversity and inclusiveness in all sectors, uh, but especially in our sector because we're doing new things. So uh, immigration is an important piece of that. We're still a relatively young sector too. Uh, you know, 55% of employees in our sector are under the age of 35. If you want to understand salaries, if you're a potential job seeker, um, the average salary, if you're coming out of a you know, one year program, et cetera, average salary is at $48,000 a year to start. Um, that's starting salary. Our average salary overall is about 72,000. That's higher than the national average, for example. Um, so we, we really do have well-paying jobs. If you're a university grad with a postgraduate uh, or you're coming out with mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, you can anticipate obviously uh, much higher salaries than that. To give you a sense of how firms, the kind of companies we have, you know, it's hard now to peg what is a tech company and how do you classify yourself. Many are, you know, frankly, most companies are doing machine learning and AI and big data and analytics and they're software companies. So, you know, depending how you kind of self-define, you could be half a dozen of these categories. This just gives you a sense of the kind of companies we have here, digital media, health tech, internet of things, uh, autonomous vehicles, etc. And there's a lot more beyond that. Well, just to kind of clue up, clue up here, uh, our sector is not just technical roles. I think that's the key point. There's a lot of non-technical roles as well, or you have a, a certain skill set, but with a little bit of training, you can have enough technical knowledge and work in our sector. So don't think you have to be 
a coder, a developer, or you know, something with deep science. There's a lot of different skill sets. Yes, the number one barrier right now, we see the number one gap is around software development and coding. There's a lot of new programs coming out to help close that gap. Uh, data science is another one. So the ability to manipulate you know, large quantities of data to understand uh, DevOps and understand uh, big data and machine learning, that's another emerging area. But so is customer success and business development. And those streams are about understanding customer needs, looking for win-win scenarios, and really being a strong facilitator of a discussion and helping customers onboard. And there's also those supporting functions, right? Things like HR, finance, marketing, and there's many more. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of different roles. So if you're on the call and you're thinking, well, it's the tech sector, how do I get involved? You can get involved. Companies like Genoa and Verifin, for example, they have their own internal, uh, Genoa has an internal academy, they call it, and Verifin has an internal training institute where they'll hire people with at least a base requisite of skills and then train them for the specific skill sets they need. These people are almost immediately productive because of that. So our companies are stepping up in a big way to make sure that you can be successful. So don't be afraid of, of trying out the sector, I guess is my point. Uh, you know, 92% of our companies are expanding, 80% are increasing the workforce. And I'd say that's even in light of COVID. Um, you know, we look at Brookfield Institute predicted 2,000 tech jobs in Newfoundland and Labrador in the next four to five years, created. Our natty top five fastest growing companies, we call them, are going to hire between 500 and 750 in the next three to four years. Um, you know, and look at, but when we look at the immigration target, it's great, 1,700 newcomers coming in, and we're meeting that target uh, lately by the province, so hats off. But 6,000 people leave our workforce every year because of our aging population. So we're still 4,300 people net out of the workforce. So we know we've got to do more around immigration and retraining and, and upskilling and things like that. Uh, so, you know, maybe to close off here, if you're wondering, okay, that all sounds great. There's a talent gap. There's different jobs available. How do I go about doing that? Uh, initial couple places to look, go to a Natty job board. We just recently launched this a couple weeks ago. Companies are still hiring a lot in our sector, even in light of COVID. Um, Natty also has an internship program where we subsidize salaries for interns. And our new cohort should be launched by August or September. So somewhere between 18 to 30 interns can work for a year. If you graduated within the last three years, you can get a year subsidized salary and go work in the tech sector. 93% of our interns get kept on by the tech companies. So it's a highly successful program. And go to Genesis. Genesis Center incubates um, startups and small companies and high growth potential companies. That's really what they are focused on. If you go to their website, they also have a career section with some of their companies. And I think in the last two or three months, there's been something like 40 to 50 job postings for tech jobs. So despite the fact that sales may be slowing, a lot of tech companies are still hiring and know that you know, the, uh, the, the prospectivity, the demand is gonna continue to increase. So I'll stop there and I'll turn it back over to Tanya or to, uh, to Ashley. All right, thank you so much, Paul. Um, that was awesome. Um, I'm just gonna simply turn it right over to Josh um, to say a few words. Awesome. Thank you very much. So I'm going to share my screen too. Um, I'm on my iPad. So I think when I share, I can't see people's faces. So if someone could just give me a, uh, um, an audio that uh, people are seeing the slides right now. Yep. You're good, Josh. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. So, um, yeah, so I'm just, uh, that was, that was awesome to hear, uh, um, uh, Paul's remarks and I'm just going to provide maybe a little bit more color from, from my side. So, uh, I've had the, the very awesome opportunity to, uh, to run a company named Misa here in Newfoundland for the last four years, uh, which has been an amazing experience. Um, and I'm, I'm so excited about, um, well, the, the, obviously Misa's opportunity, but I'm, I'm super excited about the opportunity for the tech industry in Newfoundland. Uh, and so I just, uh, I'll say a couple uh, things about MISA first and, and then I'll, we can kind of get into what I, uh, some views that I have on, on the Newfoundland tech, uh, tech scene. So just quick, quickly, I wanted to share. So 
Uh, yeah, so we're Mesa Smart Thermostats, and we've our first product that we launched with was a, a smart thermostat for electric baseboard heating. Um, and we've now shipped uh, close to 100,000 of these across North America, getting awesome reviews of, of the product. And, uh, and obviously, we're very proud to say that it's 100% developed all here in Newfoundland. And so the company started back in 2016 is when we just had the idea. And it wasn't until 2017 did we really start uh, building the product. But um, I also would like to say that we're essentially a product of, of groups like the Genesis Center, Propel ICT, MCE, Natty. Uh, there's so many of them, but we are a, we wouldn't be here without these people. So we are a product of those groups and there's so much support here in, uh, in the province that it's phenomenal. Uh, and we are close to 70 employees right now. Um, and so uh, we've hired about 15 people since the beginning of the year and, and we have active job postings right now. So uh, um, yeah, lots of, lots of growth happening. Um, just a quick picture. This is showing the, the Mesa team outside our building uh, over on Harvey Road. This was taken, um, I think it was about last end of last summer or so. So uh, we've had a We've had a, quite a few hires since then, but uh, I'm looking forward to having a new team uh, photo at some point. But obviously, you can see lots of uh, smiling faces uh, wearing our, our, Misa, our Misa swag, we call it. Um, I also wanted to share a little bit about the different types of jobs that are at Misa. Um, and so they're actually in, in three columns here. I should have put titles on the tops of the columns here. But so if you think about the first column on the left, um, it's everything related to actually developing and designing products at Misa. So we do have a lot of software developers. It's, it's probably the most, uh, most popular role at Misa uh, in terms of, of just sheer number. Um, but we also have hardware engineers who are electrical and mechanical engineers, product designers, and, and then also that do people that do project managing uh, of, of building products. Uh, and then in the middle column, um, everything related to marketing, branding, sales, and, and customer success, customer support. Um, and so that's, that's, we do all of that uh, in-house. And so there's, a, there's a great teams behind all of these uh, doing uh, those types of activities. And then on the, on the column on the right, um, sometimes we call it our back office type stuff, but everything related to operations, so supply chain logistics, uh, of course, people and culture, your uh, uh, typical HR um, teams, as well, we have finance and IT. So um, it's, a, it's a broad range of, of all types of roles that we do and uh, here at Misa, and, and we're constantly hiring for, for all these different types of roles uh, that come up uh, as we grow. And so it's not just about the kind of pure, pure tech jobs, it, it is, a, a much broader uh, uh, types of jobs that the tech industry essentially creates, uh, which is which is really great to see. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to share that these were all the different types of positions that are here today at Misa, um, and uh, as we grow, perhaps there'll be even more uh, categories of jobs uh, at our company. So so that's on Misa, and uh, I'll leave it there. But what I wanted to talk about was probably about I was trying to think about why are all the reasons that somebody would want to work in tech uh, in Newfoundland. And uh, it came down to four points that I wanted to talk about. I'm probably going to talk about point number one the most because it's the one that I'm the most kind of passionate about. Um, and so maybe I'll actually come back to point number one. Uh, but work culture 2.0, um, I think, is uh, that because tech companies are kind of I'll say maybe breaking the mold, uh, we're also rethinking about the way that we work together. Uh, and that's great for a lot of different reasons. And I'm probably gonna come back to that one actually. Um, but you get the chance to work on products and services that get to compete on a global stage right here from Newfoundland, which a lot of people in the past maybe say that's not possible. Maybe you gotta move to a big city to be able to really compete on the global stage, but that's absolutely not the case. Uh, as demonstrated by all the tech companies that are here in Newfoundland, we're competing right up there with the best of the best. And, and often Newfoundland tech companies are the best in the world uh, right here in Newfoundland. Um, I also really um, I think that it's, a, it's an opportunity for some really, really fast learning 
and professional development. I think the environment that tech jobs create probably more than any other, really, really, if you want to go somewhere and, and really improve yourself, improve your professional career, I think it's a really great place that creates the environment for that to happen. And then, and last, uh, as Paul was talking about, the, just the resilience of the tech sector. Um, in the middle of a global pandemic, tech companies still hiring, um, sales not as much of affected, or sales possibly even growing. Um, not necessarily affected by global trade markets. So it's really a, a resilient uh, sector that people can feel good about um, if they're thinking about job security. But I'll, I'm going to go back to, to Work Culture 2.0 because uh, this is, I'm, I'm super passionate about it um, in that, uh, again, like I said, it's about breaking the mold of what it actually means to work for a company. Um, and I guess if I was to, there's so many facets to this, but I think if there was like one thing to like sum it up perhaps, it's that it's really about creating a work culture that really, that people enjoy, that they love going to work, that it becomes more than a job. Actually, that's a, it's a core value of one of our, com uh, a core, one of the core values of our company is it's more than a job. Um, they're really passionate and love what they do and also creates an environment where they, they have that positive sense. And so I almost, another way to think of it, um, I often say in maybe work culture 1.0, employees are here to, to serve the companies. Um, and I, I think that's reversed. I think companies should be serving their employees. And, and that's how I think a lot of this, this new wave of, of employers coming where it's reversed and it's the employer, it, the employees always come first and it's about creating the best environment for them. And I think what people are finding, at least it's my firsthand knowledge and when I talk to others, when you flip it on its head and, and you put the work culture and employees first, uh, you ultimately get better business outcomes anyways. Um, and, and everyone is in a happier place uh, and I just really see that this has been embraced in the tech community. I think it's also um, spilling over into to other non-tech companies, just as they're seeing that this is what the future is going to look like. It's, um, but uh, I think the tech company has kind of embraced it first. Um, but, um, and I can talk more about it that if there's any questions, <laughs> but that's a sen just generally just uh, a sense on that. And I don't even know if work culture 2.0 is a thing, but uh, or a term, but uh, anyways, I, I hope that, I hope I got the, the point across, but um, I also wanted to share um, why is it a great place? Why is it great to work in tech in Newfoundland? And uh, I spent maybe an hour this morning, so I was just curious to think about all the tech companies that I could find uh, in, in, in Newfoundland. And obviously I'm missing, I think there's like a 50 on this slide, and so obviously there's, there's probably a hundred missing. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna work over the next couple of days to update this slide and, and maybe we can get it filled with all 150. Uh, but it was just even, just seeing these logos of these 50 companies is just like so rewarding to see all these awesome companies doing uh, incredible things here in Newfoundland. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I thought this really summed it up of, of like, wow, what a vibrant, strong, uh, sector of the industry uh, in Newfoundland. So um, that's my last slide and uh, I'll turn it back over and uh, I'm really excited to answer any uh, questions that come through the, the Q&A. Amazing, thank you so much, Josh. Um, it is awesome to see all of those logos on there. Um, so thank you, Paul and Josh, that was great. Um, now we are going to turn it over to you guys, the participants. Um, the point of this uh, webinar is to hear from you guys. Um, you can speak directly to Paul and Josh right now, um, which is such a great opportunity. So I'm gonna pass it over to Shanna right now. She's going to um, take you guys through the questions and answers. And um, I think we have a question already. So I'll turn it over to you, Shanna. Okay. Hi everyone, thanks Thanks for joining us and thanks to Paul and Josh, awesome presentation. Uh, there is a question from a participant named Raji, sorry if I mispronounced your name, uh, and he's wondering uh, if you could have a bit more information about the Natty internship and if you could have the contact information for the person 
to talk about that further? Yeah, sure. I mean, that, that's an easy one. We, uh, we have an internship program. Uh, there's currently, the current cohort was about 18 interns. Um, so that was fully filled about, uh, about a year ago, 18 months ago. So the new cohort starts uh, likely by September and we're aiming for anywhere between 18 and 30 that will be placed with tech companies. The way it works is tech companies post jobs, individuals have to apply, so you still have to go through a job competition with the tech company that you're interested in, but we provide a subsidy on the salary to help get some new people into tech companies. Uh, and the majority of them get uh, get kept on. So the person to write on that program, um, he's probably listening right now, is Michael Howley. Michael Howley, H-O-W-L-E-Y. And the uh, the contact for Michael is just his first name, Michael at Maddie.net. Um, but I would say it's it's likely going to be August timeframe before we have those details out. But you can also get on to Maddie's newsletter and keep up to date. And we have the jobs will be posted on our website too. Excellent. And we have another question for Josh, and that is, what is the greatest barriers for hiring international workers? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I guess uh, I would just maybe just follow up. Is it uh, for, for people that, that already are here and, uh, and are able to work or who are people uh, that are looking to come and, and they also need to work on permits, I guess, because there's different answers to those questions. Uh, because if, 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 let's say, and I'll, maybe I'll just answer both <laughs> as opposed to, if they are here, there's no barriers to enter to uh, hiring internationals. Uh, we do, uh, have done that in the past and, and continue to do it. And uh, so uh, no barriers there uh, at all. Um, on the flip side, if it's someone who is, who's outside of Canada, um, obviously there's, there's things that I've got to go through to make sure that the right permits are in place. And uh, I'm definitely not the best person to actually ask about what those barriers are. I'd have to defer to my um, uh, HR team. And actually, Paul maybe has got some experience there. He could probably answer the question better than I could. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'll be snappy too. There is, I mean, there's the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program, AIPP, that sought to streamline the process and, and get immigration pathways flowing much easier for people. So that's one program. And... Uh, uh, Ramsey, I forget, I'm hoping I hope not get that wrong, with the provincial government, his team has done a good job in getting the number of immigrants up over 1,700 per year. Um, but you can also go, the AIPP, I think, is meant to get you on a permanent residency track. There's also a temporary, uh, a temporary permit track you can take. And White Rock Consulting, uh, they're an adding member, PF Collins, both of those organizations have immigration consultants that can help get immigrants in on a temporary work permit and once you're in, they can start working on the permanent permit. So the temporary one, I think they can get people here as quickly as three to six weeks. It is amazing what they can do. People get, um, you know, people get a little bit nervous um, about the temporary track, but you once you're here and you're working, then start the permanent, the permanent side. Permanent one takes longer. So um, other barriers, I mean, Joshua would know this too, like, Obviously, you want people to come here. Can you get them to stay if they're from a country and they don't have a lot of uh, compatriots that people, culture, all that uh, makes a difference. And uh, I mean, I have uh, an immigrant on staff who recently moved to Toronto. And I used to jokingly say that the best thing I could have did was get him married up to a Newfoundlander so that he would actually have to stay here. But it didn't work that way. But I think those cultural family ties is a big part of that too. And um, also... Connect Darnell and Team Gronell, if you have any more specific questions for your own uh, look, trying to get to Newfoundland or stay in Newfoundland, you could definitely reach out to one of us. And if we can't get you the right answer, we'll find the right person who will get you the right answer. So that's definitely an option as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, if I can just jump in here, Shanna, um, yeah. part of my role here at Team Grow is uh, we are, we are very employer focused at the, at the time. Um, so I work with employers in the province um, and members of, of the industry association. So like members like uh, of Natty. Um, so we help these employers um, get started with the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program. And if you're interested, if you're interested in coming to Canada through that program, which is a really great program, it's the fastest track program right now. Um, you can go on the provincial website of Newfoundland and Labrador and there's a, there's a spot that um, highlights all the designated employers that are a part of this program already. 
um, and, you, and I'm hoping that there are some tech, uh, tech um, businesses that are, have already been designated under that uh, program. But um, if, if you guys have any other questions about that, like Shanna said, you can reach out to um, either Connect to Rynell or Team Rynell. You can find our information online. Yes. Thank you, Tanya. Um, so now if anyone else has any questions, I have a couple prepared um, just to keep the conversation going. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions based on these ones, please feel free to uh, write in the chat. Uh, but I guess for both Paul and Josh, why do you choose to work in Newfoundland? Like, what keeps you here? And why should other people want to work in Newfoundland? other than a great tech sector. Do <laughs> you want to go first, Josh? Sure, well, I mean, uh, so um, um, I actually did my university, I'm, I'm from here, but I did my university um, in uh, Nova Scotia at Dalhousie. But honestly, what brought me here was family, is, is, is the blunt answer, is I wanted to be close to family, as I know so many uh, Newfoundlandian and Labradorians do, uh, want to be close to family. Um, and uh, that, that's the beautif beautiful thing is that you get to be here and uh, be close to family and work in these awesome companies that are doing world scale, global scale type things. Um, and so, uh, um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's why I, I like the, the lifestyle of being close to family. And uh, I also just really like the, uh, the, um, I guess the feel of, of St. John's and the size it is and how, how close we are to nature and how beautiful it is here and being able to marry that with, with working at an awesome tech company is like the best of both worlds. And I think that does appeal to a lot of people. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like Josh, I'm from here, um, originally grew up here, different places around the island. Uh, I had moved away. I worked out of Ontario for about 15 years until I took the nanny job about a year and a half ago. But I had moved back, uh, like Josh, family, my wife's family are still here. I have no immediate family here anymore, but uh, came back to raise kids, safe place, beautiful nature, uh, the people, the culture, all those draws, all those ties that, uh, that hold. So that's why I came back. But for years, I went back and forth to, uh, to Ottawa. So I was one of those with a home office and on a plane all the time. Uh, so part of what has kept me here, I think, uh, I took the netty job, quite frankly, because um, the technology sector is extremely exciting. And I think we're at a pivotal, pivotal point right now with our technology sector here. I mean, uh, Misa, I can name the company. If you look at other companies like Hayork, uh, Verif, and Genoa, uh, there's so many high growth firms, and that's just to name a couple. Um, there's something happening here now, and there's a culture and supports here. It's just timing is really good for this sector. Okay. That kind of leads into my next question. Uh, and Josh, you sort of touches, touched on this as a, um, in a, just in one company, but what's the industry culture like? Is it, is it a good, like, collaborative between different companies sort of feel, or is it more of a competitive, but in a, in a good way? No, I actually think, well, I think competition is good. I think like there's a healthy amount of it here. I think we always, wow, look at their success and, and that inspires you to work more and harder. It's a great thing. So there is that healthy amount of competition, but I'd say overall it is a very, very supportive ecosystem. Um, everyone wants to share what they learn so that you don't make the same mistakes. And uh, I'm involved in, in so many different groups that are there to support and help each other out grow the tech set. Like, I think there's, as much as everyone is doing their own thing, I think we all share the passion for growing the, uh, the Newfoundland tech uh, ecosystem. And uh, uh, I think we all share the same mission or goal, and, and that's to grow this tech sector to be, let's say, as big as the oil and gas sector it is today. I mean, there's a lot of us that share that vision that we think that the tech sector can grow to be as big as as an industry like that and we all are working together um not necessarily in competition um but together and in, in to, to make that vision a reality excellent all right and i have another question here from a participant 
asking how can graduates better prepare to close the gaps from graduating in a different field towards the technical side and the knowledge of working in the tech industry? I guess I can, I can jump there a bit. We've done a lot of work this past, uh, really since I joined Natty around talent. And we, we had a number of initiatives that likely would have been announced by now, but COVID has just sort of put everything on hold. So there, we, we are working on some reskilling, kind of upskilling, retraining subsidies where people can get retrained, go back and do, if you're a post-grad, you have an undergrad or, or a graduate degree, you can go back and do a one-year certificate, those types of things. But there's also been, uh, you know, Key and Tech just about a week or two ago announced their software development program that starts the first cohorts in September, for example. And a private college, yes, amazing program. I know some of the folks that are involved there. That's really important. Um, so you can go back and do some shorter term education uh, credits like that to, to upskill in a different way. If the College of the North Atlantic has been very responsive, they have a new three-year software development program starts September. They also announced a couple of uh, certificate programs, which are a year. So you're seeing more of these kind of modular, you can do a four-month stint, go back to work, do another four-month stint. Or if you really want to get into coding, there's, uh, there's the guys with Get Coding, a local, um, a local uh, group that will just train people on coding, just you know, agile sprints about how you code and you go work for a company. And I think last I'd say, I mentioned Verifin, for example, will get new people in and they'll actually put them through their own internal academy to train people. And Josh, I'll give you last word on this one. Yeah, I'm, um, I, I, I echo everything that you just said. I guess the only other thing that I would say is, um, uh, I know when, when Misa is looking to hire, uh, we are really, uh, um, Education is, and, and kind of having the certificates and all that kind of stuff is, is great and it's obviously a good indicator. But if the main thing that we're looking for is, is just demonstration of, of awesome ability um, um, and uh, there's so many different ways to be able to do that. It doesn't necessarily need to be, a, I did this course uh, or and I got the certificate or I, I did this um, it could just be do a side project that you really passionate about it and, and learn it yourself and say, hey, I built this from scratch. And I, I learned these things doing it. It's, um, I just think that there's, there's kind of get creative about the ways that you show your, uh, your awesome talent. And that's, that's what it's about. It's just showing what you can do as a person, um, not so much the actual technical know-how. I think that's great advice. <laughs> um, now we talked a lot about talent and talent gaps, but are there is there anything else that's currently a challenge for this industry other than just finding people to work? You want to start, Josh? <laughs> we are we I, I and I and I don't mean this. I, I, I truly, I genuinely mean that Newfoundland has got all the right ingredients for an awesome tech sector here. And I'm not just saying that, like everything is here from the funding that you need to get going, the support groups are here, uh, the people here, like it is, it is, it is a really great place. Uh, and so it's actually hard to find where, where there's um, maybe some, some gaps. Um, I guess maybe one, the other one that what we've talked about before and, and you have seen it, I guess, is um, it's great to build all of this tech. It's important to be able to sell this tech. And that is another gap here that I think that we've seen and it's a challenge um, to be able to sell what you're building. Um, and so if we could find some more people who, who are passionate about selling um, and wanna get involved in tech, uh, I do think that is a really interesting area that's got a lot of room for improvement. Um, there's an ama amazing ideas and products here in Newfoundland. And uh, I think we just need to get better. Uh, one thing that we can do is get better at selling it and marketing it. And uh, that is not easy. Uh, in fact, it's, it's probably just as hard as the technical side. Um, and, I, and I do feel that sometimes we're, we're missing that selling ability here a little bit in Newfoundland. 
Yeah, and I, great points, Josh. I mean, you, you look, if you're a student, for example, or someone at earlier stage, you have Memorial Center for Entrepreneurship that can give you supports to how to get started. Josh mentioned, you know, they benefited from some of their supports. I mean, MCE at MUN, you wonder, okay, how, how has this done? They were just named last year, you know, top five new entrepreneurship centers in the world. Um, if you, once you kind of graduate as a student, you've got some of that experience. If you want incubation services, you've got Genesis Center, which I think now are up, I think they're at 27 and possibly 28 by next week, companies that are incubated at Genesis. And Genesis by UBI Global last year was named uh, one of the top um, incubation service uh, hubs as well. So, I mean, that's local organizations. And oftentimes this isn't known well outside the sector. We can be a bit of an echo chamber. We all kind of know the story within the sector, within the sector, but others don't. And part of the challenge I think is around branding and awareness because a lot of our companies, our markets aren't here. If you're a tech company, you're born global when you start here. Your market is elsewhere. So you don't, you know, you, you, you're not going in the store necessarily. Nisa is one of the only ones probably where you can actually go in the store and buy, um, and buy the thermostats and actually see the hardware. But a lot of our companies, their world is the market. It's intangible products. So the awareness might not be here, like a different sector. Uh, so part of that is what Natty's trying to do and, and what Josh is trying to do is to raise the profile and raise the awareness. So that's absolutely a challenge for us. We need to up our game. And I've said this repeatedly. I've said it to premiers. I've said it to ministers that, you know, I was flying back and forth to Ottawa. I'd see the great tourism ads about Newfoundland and how beautiful it is. My dream is that I get on a plane, an Air Canada flight, and it's an ad about Newfoundland, about our technology sector and all the things that we're doing here to attract people to come. So. And now, Paul, we have another question for you. It's asking to speak a little bit more about data science in Newfoundland and Labrador. Yeah, there's, there's certainly a skill shortage across Canada for data scientists. So it's people who know how to manipulate and work with huge data sets, who know how to glean insights from data. We all know about machine learning and big data and analytics, um, but you need to know how to mine that information. You need to know what you're trying to find and you need to be able to make decisions based on it. So it's not like you can take a piece of technology and plug it in and we're at a point where machine learning or AI can say, this is what's relevant for your business. It's people who understand the science of data and what's relevant and how you can measure and how you can manipulate. And even things as basic as, um, you know, the most obvious is things like Tableau software and, and other um, kind of infographic and data visualization software and how you can manipulate that to tell a story, um, create dashboards, all that is kind of in the realm of data science. Kind of related to it is DevOps and the ability to work with new cloud computing architectures, et cetera. So it's frankly, it's just that ability to understand um, data and how to, how to get information and take action based on it. It's probably the easiest way that I describe it, but there's a shortage for sure. I just, I mean, we do uh, very little actually on this side and, and we're gonna be doing more in the future, but just like some more uh, easy examples for, for people like uh, we actually use machine learning to help make uh, the accuracy of measuring temperature in a room more accurate and so we have a super talented guy at MISA and that's his job is to look at, at this data and train these models to make our thermostats actually more accurate um, and then we're actually using um, some, some extensions of that to actually predict temperature um, over time and so um, it is, it's kind of finding its way into all businesses in, in different formats and, uh, but, uh, yeah. Excellent. All right. So I don't see any new questions. So did you guys want to have a last, last word, something to clue up your thoughts? Yeah, Josh, you want to, you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I just, just to sum up again, I just think uh, what, what Paul was saying about I think we're at a tipping point, I really do think that that's the case. There's been some, some early examples, uh, such as Verifin, who have really play, blazed the trail. And you're going to see this breakout now, I think, of many, many tech companies. And it's just such an exciting time to be. And I'm, I'm encouraged with all the support that's here. Um, I do think that the, the governments are doing great jobs. I know there's ways to improve always, 
but I, I'm super happy with, with everything that the government is doing. There's private funding here. Um, it's just, it's a great place, great opportunity. And um, I encourage more people to, uh, to join the sector. Yeah, it's funny, that's a great segue. And I, 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 in case I needed it, I had an extra slide at the very end of my presentation here. And uh, I'm just going to share my slide. I mean, I, I put here, Verifin got $515 million last year on their, uh, their recapitalization deal. The biggest in Canadian history, not just Newfoundland's history, the biggest in Canadian history, $515 million. Um, I think in Newfoundland, the next biggest would have been Verifin a number of years ago when they got $60 million. But what's more telling is the investors that went into Verifin at $60 million, the same investors stayed in at five hundred and fifteen. million. A lot of times when you're looking at uh, you know, private equity sources, they want to get their multiple and then get their money out. They want to make their money over a time horizon and then pull it out. The fact that they all stay in shows you the sort of trajectory and growth potential that seasoned investors see in a company like Verifin. You've got Colab Software, they've got 2.7 million. They also got into, um, into California, into an accelerator in California. You've got Kraken Robotics, you know, out in Donovan's Mount Pearl, they had a big contract, 35, 40 million, plus an ocean supercluster project. CDL Atlantic, which is based out of Halifax, the cohort last spring, five out of 10 companies were from Newfoundland and Labrador. And it's all four Atlantic provinces that get to go. Half the companies were from here. Breathe Sweet, I mean, Brett Bokey benefited from Bounce uh, and some other supports. And Brett, uh, you know, got, I think Brett's 24 years old, maybe. I think Adam might be, I shouldn't say their age, maybe. The guys, <laughs> are in their, <laughs> the guys are in their 20s and they're getting, you know, $3 million and half a million dollars. And it's just incredible. So there, when, when Josh says there, there's something here right now, there is something here right now. We're punching well above our weight. We just got to keep it going for more and more companies. So I'd say a lot of belief in the sector and the potential is enormous. So let's keep it going. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's, it's definitely exciting. It makes me a little bit excited to see that we have this industry just like, just about to like really take off um, at, at such an important industry. So Thanks. Thank you so much uh, to, to Paul and to Josh for taking time out of your busy schedules and uh, joining us in our very first Ask an Expert. Uh, it's going to be a series. We're hoping to roll it out to different uh, industries and so that people who want to live and work in Newfoundland and Labrador can actually speak to people who know exactly what that entails. So again, thank you so, so much for uh, participating in the very first one. Um, maybe we'll have you back again for another one <laughs> because I think that, that there's something going on in tech. It's really, really exciting. Um, also, thank you to all the participants who joined the uh, joined us in this very first one as well. We hope you learned as much as we did, uh, and I hope that you have a great, great rest of your day. <laughs>